straight up late 90s, early 2000s motocross might be the coolest thing to ever happen in motorsports and might be the only thing keeping me together right now. I'm gonna tell you why. That's the intro, let's just get into it. At the tail end of the 90s, freestyle motocross burst onto the extreme sports world stage when the X Games included the new discipline at their fourth running in San Francisco. I don't think anyone in attendance knew it at the time, but dudes doing insane tricks on motorcycles was about to eclipse NASCAR and IndyCar in popularity and influence pop culture for nearly a decade. But why? What made this niche sport so appealing to the mainstream? And why has it sort of fallen off? To answer that, let's start at the beginning. Compared to the double backflip, no-handed front flip state of freestyle motocross today, motocross had a pretty tame beginning here in the US. Motocross was born in Europe with cross-country races called scrambles. An American Husqvarna dealer by the name of Edison Dye introduced the sport to Americans in the 60s by bringing over some of the top European riders and having them compete to promote the sport and thus sell some bikes. Because of the low cost of entry, high amount of adrenaline ratio, the sport exploded in popularity through the 70s. I mean, on any Sunday was a motocross doc that got nominated for an Oscar in 1971. Then the American Motorcyclist Association created their motocross championship in 1972. One of the races was held at the Los Angeles Coliseum. It was coined the Super Bowl of motocross. Through the 70s, there were more of these indoor stadium supercrosses, and where the Europeans typically dominated the traditional cross-country motocross events, American riders were really good on the tight and technical supercross courses. Another shift was the kinds of bikes these guys were riding. Motocross started on the back of European bikes like the Huskies Eddie Dye was selling, but as the 80s rolled around, more Japanese manufacturers were getting into the game and winning. Suzuki's, Yamaha's, and Kawasaki's were cleaning up with their powerful water-cooled two-stroke engines, and their simple single-shock rear suspension was lighter and more capable than what the Europeans were putting out at the time. The 90s were a time of flux in the world of motocross. The AMA wanted to help four-stroke engines be competitive in the sport and allowed four-stroke engines with displacements as high as 550 cc's to compete in the same class as 250 cc two-strokes. Along with the splitting of the stroke preference, which I probably could have phrased better, a new discipline of motocross was beginning to take shape. Mike Metzger was a kid from Huntington Beach, California, who learned to ride a bike at three years old and started racing motocross when he was six. In junior high, he got on his first mountain bike and could have competed in the pro downhill circuit when he graduated high school. But what Mike would go on to do would be much greater. Combining tricks from BMX and the speed of motocross, Mike was one of the first originators of a new kind of moto. Mike Metzger is known as the godfather of freestyle motocross. You watch early freestyle videos like Fox Terra Firma, Throttle Junkies, and Krusty's Dirt Demons, and the scene back then seems like it was more about hucking huge jumps in the wild than it was about pulling complicated moves. But that was soon to change because the X Games took notice. Like I said at the top of this episode, the X Games added freestyle motocross to their lineup in 1999. And to borrow an analogy from my buddy Jeremiah, X Game was the best because they basically gave the audience 10 evil Knievels and then pit them against each other for bragging rights. And from the jump, there was a built-in rivalry. Pastrana versus Deegan. These two competitors could not have seemed more different. On one hand, you had Travis Pastrana, the wholesome 15-year-old from Maryland, the kid was a motocross prodigy poised for a spot on the Suzuki Supercross factory team, but he wasn't old enough to race in Supercross yet. And he's out here fighting against some of the pioneers of freestyle motocross. And on the other hand, you had Brian Deegan, the bad boy of the sport. Deegan was from Bellevue, Nebraska, but it had moved to SoCal to chase his Supercross dreams when he was 18. Deegan had won Supercross events as a privateer, but he didn't have the cash to continue racing at that level, so he shifted his focus to freestyle. His image stood in stark contrast to the young Pastrana. He had tattoos, his shoulder pads had spikes, and he rolled with a crew that called themselves the Meadow Militia. Just listen to how the commentators introduced Brian. Brian Deegan, thank God he's not dating your daughter. I certainly think the X Games management 
helped Deegan and Pastrana play out their images for the show, but I can't blame them because I think this was a key to the sport's success. The tricks were impressive on their own, even in 99, but giving the audience personalities to latch onto made it so much easier to root for someone. The contrasting personas also appealed to a wide audience all over the country. Do you root for the squeaky clean boy wonder Travis Estrana, or are you pulling for the Nebraska Supercross underdog who loved to party? It's called giving the audience choice, and it was brilliant. Speaking of choice, maybe the high-flying antics of freestyle were a little too much for you. Maybe you wanted something a little more traditional, like good old-fashioned supercross racing. Well, lucky for you, the mid to late 90s happened to be the golden age of the sport. While freestyle was picking up steam, supercross was being dominated by California native Jeremy McGrath. Between 1993 and 2000, McGrath picked up seven AMA supercross championships. He simply could not be beaten. Jeremy's style was extremely smooth, which satisfied fans with an eye for the technical, but McGrath's flair also imbued him, again, with a lot of personality for fans to latch onto. He loved putting it on for the fans, which earned McGrath the nickname Showtime. He also loved to party, so that was pretty cool too. Thanks again to Raycon for sponsoring this episode of Wheelhouse. You know, when I'm not making videos or trying to convince myself I can play guitar or working on my Imperial, I have to find other things to occupy my time. Most of the time, I just pop in my Raycon Everyday E25 earbud, turn on some Slipknot and escape with some cathartic rage while cleaning my apartment. No matter where my cleaning takes me, I know my Raycons aren't gonna let me down. They've got six hours of battery life and seamless Bluetooth connectivity. No wonder my friends whom I've never met, like J.R. Smith and Rich the Kid and Snoop Dogg, I'll rock them too. I genuinely love my Raycons. They're convenient, they've got really good sound, great battery life, I really love them. To get yours today, hit the link in the description or go to buyraycon.com slash donut to get 15% off your order today. Now, let's make like Jeremy McGrath and jump back into this episode. As the calendar hit the year 2000, both Freestyle Moto and Supercross, heck, extreme sports in general, we're about to enter their most high profile decade yet. I don't want to sound out of touch. Extreme sports are still progressing to insane levels today with YouTube and social media. I mean, my IG Explorer page is basically filled with car stuff and BMX riders like Garrett Reynolds. But 15 years ago, it was different. And I think that's because of the lack of YouTube and social media. The only place you could watch extreme sports was on TV. Both the X Games and Supercross were broadcast on ESPN, giving dirt bikes as much legitimacy as other sports that have been around for decades. It was a really exciting time for seven-year-old Nolan. Through the early 2000s, the freestyle moto tricks only got more impressive with every year. At the 2002 Philly X Games, Kerry Hart pulled the first ever backflip in competition after two failed attempts in 2000 and 2001. Even crazier, Hart won silver. What could be crazier than a backflip? How about a no-footed backflip by Mike Metzger? The tricks kept getting even more impressive with the deceptively difficult 360, and one of my personal favorite moves, Chuck Carruthers' body burial in 2004. The tricks were taking less inspiration from BMX and becoming an art style all their own. Less motorsport and more Cirque du Soleil. Things were heating up even more over in Supercross. Jeremy McGrath was in the twilight of his career before finally being dethroned by Ricky Carmichael, AKA the GOAT. Ricky's arrival to Supercross ushered in a new era. At first, Carmichael didn't do so hot. He knew he had the skills to beat McGrath, but he lacked the stamina for the demanding Supercross arenas. So he took a new approach similar to Formula One drivers. He focused on fitness and health, and that's what really allowed him to win the Supercross championship in 2001 and hold on to it until 2006, with the exception of 2004, which was snapped up by Chad Reed, the Australian guy. While Supercross might not have had the bombastic theatrics of freestyle, what it did have was rivalries in spades. McGrath versus Carmichael, Carmichael versus Reed, Reed versus Stewart, Pastrana versus everyone. Just like any other motorsports, all these storylines meant that you weren't just watching for the on-track action, but you wanted to see your favorite character come out on top at the end of the story. 
It's a tried and true formula you can find in wrestling, tennis, and Formula One. I mean, that's like 80% of the reason I watch Formula One. So what kind of impact did these sports have on pop culture? Well, I would say a lot. Today, I'm not very cool. I don't dress cool, my meme game is pretty weak, and I definitely don't know what the kids are listening to. But back in the early 2000s, that might have been the only time in my life when what I thought was cool was also what everyone else thought was cool. Let's start with fashion. Dude, if you lived in a rural town and you didn't own at least one Fox, No Fear, or Metal Militia shirt for every day of the week, you are not cool. If you wanted people to know you were down back then, if you wanted to flex on your sixth grade class, you threw on that Fox jersey with pride because you knew you were the coolest kid asking if he could go to the bathroom that day. The style's popularity through the mid-2000s shows just how universally the American public loved motocross, which is pretty amazing. Imagine if like NASCAR driver gear became trendy in an earnest and unironic way. What if people started wearing F1 team polos like Felipe because of the undeniable swagger of drivers like Lewis Hamilton or Lance Stroll? I would love that. And it wasn't just clothing either. Motocross found its way into all facets of entertainment. There were video games like MX vs ATV Unleashed and EA's Freakstyle, which featured real riders like Brian Deegan. Speaking of Brian Deegan, he had a cameo in that Vin Diesel XXX movie. Carrie Hart had a cameo in Charlie's Angels. And who could forget the Disney original movie Motocrossed? I love Motocrossed. If you wanted your movie to be extreme to the max, you had to get a freestyle moto guy in there. Motocross's popularity also coincided with the commercialization of music like Nu Metal, which also featured dirt bikes and other extreme sports in their music videos. The riders may have been from all over the country, but because many of them had moved to Southern California, the trends of the region intertwined with the sport, and as a result, they were broadcast out to the rest of the country. I think because of the internet and social media, tastes are a little more global today. But man, back then, it was all about SoCal, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened? Why did the scene kind of fall off? Well, to understand, we have to go back to 2006. It's X Games 12 in 2006 at the Staples Center in Los Angeles. Travis Pastrana is at the top of the ramp, preparing for the biggest trick of his life. He puts his goggles on, and what happens next seems impossible. On his first try, Travis Pastrana lands a double backflip. I watched this live on TV and I'll never forget it. It was easily the craziest thing anyone had ever seen. If he messed up, he could have easily died. He promised to never attempt the trick again. It was a big deal. Travis would compete in X Games for five more years before breaking his foot in competition, attempting a Rodeo 720 at X Games 17 in 2011. For me, the double backflip was the height of the X Games. It was an unbelievable feat that played out on live TV and recapped by millions of kids when they got back to school later that summer. It was a cultural moment. Between 1999 and his last appearance in 2012, Pastrana had become an American icon, an unrivaled talent with no equal, and that was kind of the problem. When he left, there was no one to really take his place because he was just that good. Travis has so much star power that his absence might have taken away from the popularity. Another blow to the scene was a symptom of suffering from success. Outside of X Games and Supercross, lots of regular people were buying dirt bikes. Too many people, some might say. And as a result, a lot of previously no problem riding spots became overrun with people and shut down. And that sucks. But when you have a bunch of wannabe Mike Metzgers who don't know what they're doing, destroying trails and being a general nuisance, you can't be surprised when the neighbors complain and shut it down. Researching this episode filled me with a level of nostalgia I hadn't felt in a long, long time. I wasn't expecting to have feelings for footage of someone doing a Superman seat grab or seeing James Stewart do his Bubba scrub. The world isn't getting more complicated. We had just as many problems back then as we do now, but something that does seem simpler is an agreement that a motorcycle flying through the air is really cool, whether it be off a freestyle ramp or around a racetrack. That's the episode. We put out a video pretty much every day, so please subscribe to the channel if you'd like to see more. Follow Donut Media on all social media at Donut Media. Follow me at Nolan J. Sykes. 
Uh, Titan Speed Engineering for all your racing oil pump needs. Uh, be kind, I'll see you next time. Four million subs. Thank you guys so much, whether it's showing up in the comments or the subreddit or on social media. It means the world seeing you guys take part in our community. To celebrate this monumentous occasion and to say thank you to you guys, we have made this commemorative four million sub sticker. It's not for people who come for five, it's for you guys, the fantastic four million. And we're only gonna make as many as we sell, so they're never going to make it again. Once they're done, they're done. This bad guy is proof that you are here right now. So again, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, donut is only donut because of people like you, and I can't thank you enough. <laughs> One more time. Now go buy a sticker, man.